Hello and welcome to the Global Church Project. I'm Graeme Hill. Alexander Chow is an American-born Chinese who was raised in Southern California. He completed his PhD in theology at the University of Birmingham, following a postdoctoral fellowship at Renmin University of China, where he was doing research into Chinese Christianity. Alexander Chow joined the University of Edinburgh's Centre for the Study of World Christianity in September 2013. He's written extensively on Christianity in China and more broadly in East Asia. His books explore historical types of indigenous theology in China, and he puts Eastern Christian thought into a dynamic conversation with Chinese views of the world. Alex Chow, welcome to the Global Church Projects. Thank you. You've uh, written quite a lot on the growth of the church in China, and until recently, the Chinese church was considered a rural, maybe marginal religion in the Chinese context, but there's been movement to urban centres and urban intellectuals have become more and more involved. Can you describe some of that shift? Sure. Um, In the 1980s, there was what people would describe as a Christianity fever happening in China. Mm. Um, And many um, internal government documents would talk Mm. about what they call the four many's. The many old, the many women, the Mm. many illiterate, and the many ill. So it's very much a a marginalized people um, from the villages that 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 needed something, some kind of a, a rice Christianity yeah. that were drawn to Christianity. But as um, as we move into the 1990s, with the with the growth of um, on the one hand economic success, and on the other hand um, intellectual um, growth within the universities, Christianity yeah. was growing in urban centers in both those areas. So you have academics who are studying Christianity, many who would not consider themselves Christians, but mm. still were drawn to Christianity. And others in, in the urban centers who, who um, whether they, they are involved in entrepreneurial, uh, excuse me, whether they are mm. op- entrepreneurs uh, mm. working in businesses or also um, in teaching in universities or well-educated individuals that were drawn to Christianity. And so the mm. urban centers became is becoming where Christianity is growing the most today. Can you give us examples of public theologians in China today who are making use of Calvin's thought? Sure. Um, There's probably two major groups of Mm. uh, public theologians in China today. Uh, Mm. One of them is uh, is a group that's often associated with human rights activism. Mm. And so for many of them, they'll come from sort of a legal background and often argue from the basis from, uh, uh, from John Calvin's writings um, and uh, sort of reform theology, the, the sense that constitutionalism is something that comes mm. out of a covenantal relationship with God. Mm. And so because of, of the covenantal relationship, we, we can have a better constitutionalism built around a covenant mm. with God. And so there's many who, who build from a, a, a legal perspective um, and arguing about constitutionalism and the rule of law um, as ways to engage uh, the society and the mm. state as well. Mm. But then there's a second group, and the second group um, often borrowing from uh, mm. neo-Calvinist uh, thinkers from uh, like Abraham Kuyper and mm. Herman Babink, who look at uh, the church and how mm. it engages uh, the, the society in, in, in the cultural mandate. So it's looking at um, the church as a type of NGO, uh, non, non-governmental organization, and mm. engaging the civil society and working for uh, the, the, those who are hurt in society. Mm. So is there a lot of crossover in thought between those two groups, or do they remain quite separate? They're, they tend to have very independent thinking, but there is mm. a lot of uh, cross-pollination. Mm. Um, so. Some of the groups will, uh, some individuals from each of the groups would, would publish in uh, articles in magazines mm-hmm. written by, uh, published by other uh, churches from mm-hmm. another group. Um, and vice versa, there's, there's uh, blogs and, and um, Weibo, which is like a, a Twitter, a Chinese Twitter that, that is used uh, by both, uh, both mm-hmm. groups um, very, very frequently. And Pentecostalism has been booming in China too. Have the Pentecostals tended to engage some of the public theology issues, or not so far? Um, so far, Pentecostalism, or well, it, Pentecostalism itself in China is, is somewhat complex, yeah. and uh, a lot of people would actually resist the term Pentecostal yeah. in China. Yeah. Um, but uh, mm. Pentecostalism has been growing, 
Um, but it has tended to avoid uh, engagement with society and with mm. the state. So as a consequence, it, it has not really um, been very strong in the public mm. theological uh, engagement. Um, there are a growing number of uh, mm. uh, Christian intellectuals that are Pentecostals and mm. are therefore also wanting to engage society, but, but it, it has not really developed too much in terms of the public mm. theology. Can you give us examples of the way in which public theology is engaging law or constitution or other social justice issues today in China? Sure. Um, there's um, a, a large number of uh, public theologians who are looking at um, how uh, human rights uh, issues are violated in China um, and trying to um, ask the question, well, wh what is uh, the ultimate rule? Is it the law that's, that's uh, in, in charge or is it the government that's in charge of wielding the law as a tool to persecute? And so there's, uh, many of these public theologians are lawyers and they're trying to use the law to engage the state on its own turf, effectively. So you've given us these laws, we, we use these laws, and we try to argue the human rights cases based on the laws you have given us that you have been violating. And the government, of course, doesn't quite like that. Mm. So you tend to use Chinese public theologians mm -hmm. rather than public intellectuals or Chinese new Calvinists. Sure. Why do you use that term? Why do you prefer that term? Um, I think the term public intellectuals, Chinese public intellectuals, is, uh, is, is still valid, but it probably mm. does not um, mm. capture the essence of, of what uh, mm. these individuals are trying to do. They want to see how their Christian faith and their Christian thoughts can have mm. an influence in the public sphere. So it's, it's very much a theological reflective um, reflection on the Christian mm. on their Christian identity engaging the public sphere. And so that's why I prefer public theology, Chinese public theologian instead of Chinese public intellectual. Mm. In terms of Chinese New Calvinism, um, that's a term that uh, some have begun to use um, simply in parallel with what's happening in North America. The, the New Calvinism from people like John, John Piper, mm -hmm. um, Mark Driscoll, Al, Al Mohler, and so forth. Um, the trouble with that term is New Calvinism in China, uh, excuse me, New Calvinism mm -hmm. in the States is very much uh, wrapped around this question of um, uh, a tulip, uh, mm. questions of salvation, questions of election, and all of these types mm. of things. But that is not really Calvinism in, in a broader sense, right? If you think mm. about the historic Calvinist churches, uh, Presbyterian or Reformed mm. churches, uh, they would say, well, yes, that, that's a part of Calvinism, mm. but that's not the whole thing. Calvinism embodies a lot more, and in particular, it embodies an ecclesiology, a, a theology of the church. Mm. And so for these uh, public theologians in China, their use of Calvin is less about the question of salvation, but it's more about the question of the church. Mm. How does a church engage the society? How does a church engage mm. the state? It's mm. less about... Um, you know, whether or not we adhere to four-point or five-point Calvinism, but it's about how um, the church and the magistrate is to engage, which is uh, a topic, of course, of, mm. of John Calvin himself. It was, it's the fourth book of his uh, institutes, mm. um, talks about the church. And how they examined that question um, alongside public theology and ecumenism since Edinburgh 1910, Yes, um, Edinburgh 1910, of course, was, uh, um, was a, a landmark uh, event. And within China, it was one of many stimuli to push the church towards uh, independence, independence from foreign denominations and, and uh, foreign powers in, 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 in that way. Um, and so the trajectory of the church in China has very much been um, how do we engage the broader church, the global church, but how do we have our own church? How are we on our, how can we stand on our own two feet as the Chinese church? Not as uh, the, the younger church, the, yeah. the little brother of um, the American church or British church or what have you, but uh, its own. 
And in that process, um, the public theology that's been coming out mm -hmm. of China has been one that asks the question, well, how, how do we exist in distinction from the, the world and in distinction from, from the issues that, that are being raised up by the, the secularists or the Buddhists or the Confucianists mm -hmm. within our society? And it's, mm -hmm. it's uh, both a, um, a resistance against but also an engagement with. So it's a both and type of a mm -hmm. question. Um, in which public theology is trying to uh, has been growing um, a sense of um, an identity in which Chinese Christianity is something that is um, unique by itself. And do you see then an indigenous or indigenous forms of theology emerging as a consequence of that wrestle in China that are, are unique to the Chinese context? Um, yes and no. Um, a lot of uh, Chinese theology um, has, of course, borrowed from the legacy of the missionaries. Um, but not only the missionaries, but also as uh, many um, Western or uh, foreign texts have been translated into Chinese or, or have been accessed by Chinese, um, it's been adopted. Um, so you have a lot of uh, everybody from Schleiermacher to Calvin to mm. you know, um, uh, Kuiper uh, being embraced by uh, Chinese thinkers. So mm -hmm. on the one hand, it, it, it doesn't seem unique. But on the other hand, it's, it's a question of how it's being applied, I mm -hmm. think. And oftentimes, the ways it's being applied engages questions of the Chinese society that are very different from outside mm -hmm. of there. Part of that is the multi, mul multiple religious environment that mm -hmm. China has, has always mm -hmm. uh, been in. And it's, it's engaging the question of theology of religion. So how, do, how does mm. Christianity engage other religions? Um, and, and asking questions around that. But it's also bringing in characteristics from Confucianism. For example, um, the, a priority in, in the family, which translates to a priority in the church. Mm. Right? So it's, it's very distinct from a more individualistic orientation mm. that we may often characterize as, as Western Christianity. Yeah, I thought I'd ask you about that because... I've talked to some who suggest that the church was well equipped for ministry under communism, mm. but now that some of that ideology is, is waning, at least in, in amongst the middle classes and people are becoming wealthier, more globalised, there's a sense amongst some that the church isn't all that well equipped to deal with this new environment. What's your sense about how the church is engaging with a, a, a new wealth, new modernity, a new globalization in China? Uh, is it able to come to terms with all of those challenges and how's it doing that? Um, that that's a great question. Um, I think w one way to look at it is um, this push of uh, globalization, and the, the global mm. market and all these different things um, is causing a lot of societal problems, right, mm. in society. Um, uh, and a lot of uh, mental and emotional uh, strain mm. on society. Mm. Um, and yet at the same time, there's, there's all this, in, internally there's a rapid urbanization, mm. and so people are leaving their, their families in, in the villages and going mm. to the urban centers to work and then coming back on, mm. on, you know, once or twice a year mm. for, for holidays. Um, so you have all this uh, social angst. But at the same time, the church is thriving. Mm. And the church seems to be responding to this that yeah. it is almost in the, the social ills of society that the gospel is really seen. Um, that it is through these struggles mm -hmm. that uh, draws many people to uh, the church. And so the church, um, perhaps uh, you know, uh, very few uh, uh, church leaders will have PhDs or, or uh, even, you know, even seminary education, um, mm -hmm. but they are doing a, a fantastic job considering the circumstances. Hmm. I wonder about the kind of, I don't know if this is the right word to use, but whether there was something of a vacuum that was left, a religious or spiritual vacuum that was left as, again, correct me if I'm wrong, as communist ideology became less um, popular amongst the middle classes. Is there something of a vacuum that is there that is being filled by a range of religious and spiritual and, uh, and ideological beliefs? That Christianity is fitting into, 
Well, what's, what's going on there in the Chinese context? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, the word vacuum is, is probably a good, good mm-hmm. one to use. Um, I've, I've used it myself, uh, it, particularly during the 1960s and 70s of mm-hmm. the, the Cultural Revolution. Um, the, the Maoist dogmatism during that time really um, uh, suppressed anything that was mm-hmm. opposing it. Which meant every, it, all religious ideologies, all, yeah. all, even Confucianism was was uh, trampled upon, and and so um, it was not just Christianity, but all sorts of religious and ideological um, alternatives were trampled upon. Um, but after the 80s uh, and 90s, we have yeah. this this surge in um, in ideas and this surge of interest in religions. Yeah. And in different ideologies, very broadly, Christianity, of course, being one of the major components to that. Mm-hmm. And Christianity, of course, is 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 a growing voice, as we've already discussed, in terms of a public theology, and it has mm-hmm. a very strong public force. Mm-hmm. Um, so yes, there there is this uh, almost a competition of mm-hmm. ideas, but it is also one in which uh, Christianity, in you know, in uh, if you think about it, Christianity in 1949 has, um, you know, what around 500,000 uh, Christian mm. Protestants, mm. Uh, and you know the latest estimates around uh, 70, 70 million. Mm. That's that's quite a, a turn of events. Mm. Um, it's still a minority uh, religion mm. in in China, but it is uh, definitely growing in its its strength. And are they mainly based based still in rural areas or? Has it been a significant growth of the Chinese church in the major urban centres? It's a, it's a mixture of both. Um, yeah. And part of that is, is, is because of this mm. growth, um, as we've discussed, in, um, in mm. the entrepreneurs, in, in major urban centres, uh, intellectuals mm. in the urban centres, but also from those who migrate from the rurals, uh, rural areas to the urban centres. So you have a, a, mm. a, migra- mig- mm. a migration that, that, that shifts mm. that as well. I want to ask you about uh, theology of sin. So you've discussed the ways in which Asian societies, Korean, Japanese, Chinese, are exploring a fresh theology of sin as it relates to their experience and their traditions. Can you unpack some of that for us? Sure. Um, the, the doctrine of sin, uh, when, when it was first introduced by, by missionaries to China, um, Japan, and Korea, so East Asia, uh, was one that was introduced um, almost as a very, very foreign idea. Mm. Uh, the terminology that was used w- really conveyed this idea of, of crime, uh, a crime that mm. a person is convicted of and, and recognized as guilty. Yeah. So it was very legal terminology. Um, but within uh, East Asian religiosity um, and, and, and ideas, uh, uh, there, there is no such thing as that. Uh, that um, that people are inherently good, and that there there may be some disposition to to do evil, but overall people are fundamentally good. So the, the doctrine of sin became a major stumbling block for mm. many people in the engagement between Christianity and East Asia. Mm. But really, it wasn't until uh, the end of World War II, mm. um, roughly, that. That you see in in Japan, Korea, and uh, South Korea, and and China, this growing uh, thirst for something else. Um, in Japan, you have uh, theologies uh, um, uh, in which uh, people are speaking about the pain of God, um, mm. and and this is of course coming out of this uh, idea in which we we've suffered through the you know World War II, uh, we've experienced Hiroshima. And you know we, we recognize uh, the problems mm. that are in society, and really we need to speak about the pain of God. Mm. Um, in South mm. Korea, you have uh, in the 1970s, in particular, this growing uh, military force, a military junta, mm. um, a military dictatorship ruling mm. over South Korea. Mm. And during this time, um, uh, Korean Christians were thinking about sin in terms of the structural sins, so people who have been sinned against, that we mm. all have been sinned against by society and different aspects of society, and we mm. oppressed must rise up against those forces that have sinned against us. Mm. Um, and, and then in the case of China, you have a growing 
a uh, number of individuals, both within the churches as well as within uh, intellectual circles, many of whom are not Christians, who have been drawn to the doctrine of original sin mm -hmm. and saying, actually, this original sin, this is what we face in society. This is the mm -hmm. ills that we see in society. And how are they exploring the doctrine of original sin in a context where sin wasn't a natural idea? Yeah, the, because the, the term and the idea was not very natural, mm. um, there's actually something attractive about it, okay. which is sort of yeah. odd. But it's, it's something that, well, it's, it doesn't make sense, but there's something out there that we know we need. Mm. And there is something here that just does not make sense. And with the vacuum in China, does that make the Chinese mind more open to these new ideas? So the reason I ask that question is, in some contexts that are much more traditional um, than an emerging China where there might be something of an ideological or spiritual vacuum, um, you've got to work very hard at connecting with traditional ideas and spiritualities. I'm just wondering whether the vacuum in China does actually open up opportunities for ideas like original sin and others uh, to be explored in a fresh way. Yeah, I think it, the, the fact that there, there is a spiritual vacuum mm -hmm. uh, in China does open those opportunities mm -hmm. for the doctrine of original sin and other um, uh, ideas to come in and, and, and have a fresh new um, look mm -hmm. on society. Um, on the flip side, Christianity is not the only thing that's filling that yeah. spiritual vacuum. And so yeah. there's, um, people will also speak about a Buddhism fever or a, mm. a Confucianism fever. Yeah. And so there's this growing of uh, more traditional um, ideologies as well as yes. uh, the Christianity. Yep. And so with, with the multiplicity of ideas, it's, it's, a, a, it's a new battle of ideas in a sense. Mm. Um, and, and therefore, Christianity in this, this new context uh, has a great opportunity to, to grow, but it also has a great need to engage with mm. uh, the multiplicity of ideas mm. that is being introduced at the time. Mm. What about other doctrines like a doctrine of spirit? So are there ways in which new mythology connects at all with the Chinese mind or Chinese thought? I think um, the doctrine of, uh, of the Holy Spirit um, has, has had a very strong um, mm. uh, presence in, in, in China. Um, on mm. the one hand, um, you know, through, of course, the, the so-called Pentecostal or uh, mm. more charismatic uh, tendencies of, of Christianity, but also in terms of uh, spiritual theology um, and mm. uh, just a sense in which in many more, um, if I can say, more, more conservative Christians, there, there's a, a stronger uh, leaning towards uh, a more mystical theology, uh, uh, a, a connection with God, uh, that uh, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit is, in, in a sense, uh, burgeoning within. Mm. Can you think of other indigenous forms of Chinese theology that are worth mentioning today? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the general... Um, direction of the church um, since, in particular, since the 1980s mm. has been one that, um, on the one hand, is searching for a new identity. You don't mm. have missionaries, you don't have foreign denominations, mm. um, you have more or less two, maybe three different major groupings, categories mm. of Christians in China. Um, and so during this time, you know, there, one of the major things that people are thinking mm. about is the question of suffering. Mm. That some people talk about the gospel as a mm. gospel of, of suffering. And, and that, that the church in China is a mm. church that suffers. And has gone through a death and a resurrection of sorts, paralleling mm. um, the, the life of Christ. Um, but there's also, uh, because of this, this uh, competition of ideas, there is also this uh, return to the more traditional um, religions and, and philosophies and, and theologies that reflect mm. on that and in some ways integrate that into uh, its, its Christian mm. theology. Um, along with that, there's uh, probably a, a third major um, group, which are intellectuals. There's this huge growth 
in intellectuals, uh, academics, um, scholars who who are drawn to Christianity or, or drawn to Christian theology, but are not Christians. Mm. And so they engage Christian theology as a way to engage society, but not as a confessional person who says that, you know, I, I follow Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. There, there's no profession of the faith, but there's a, um, a way in, in, in which these individuals, in, in, in some senses, are, are scholars of Christianity and are learned um, followers, uh, mm. followers of a learned Christianity, um, what some people have termed a cultural Christian, mm. uh, not, not in the sense of uh, uh, how we have in, in Western societies, you know, in which you were born into a church and you left it, mm. but that you are a Christian in the terms of its culture, that mm-hmm. the cultural ideas that okay. Christianity... And so they, they, they think that the cultural ideas which have served the West well from time to time have some value in, in terms of exploring them for Chinese public theology. Yes. And as contextual theologies have been explored, how have Chinese ideological resources, past and present, been engaged with? Um, mainly, they, they have been engaged... Um, Chinese ide- ideological sources have uh, been both a, a blessing and a burden mm. on Chinese Christianity. Uh, on the one hand, um, uh, your, many of the more conservative uh, Christians in China have, have tried to reject it. Mm. Um, on the other hand, uh, some, uh, some Chinese Christians who would perhaps be more, more liberal in their theology have tended to embrace mm. uh, Chinese religious uh, background um, and, and, and integrate it within Christianity. And I think, to be honest, I think uh, the, the, the space that we need to be in is sort of in between yeah. both of those. That there is a recognition of um, the ideological resources from the past, from China's mm. past, um, and, and engagement with it because that mm. shapes the way that the Chinese society, Chinese mm. people think uh, today, mm. whether or not they, they, they realize it. Mm. Um, but at the same time, it's not just a wholesale uh, Confucianization of Christianity or, or Buddhization of Christianity, but it needs to be one that in which Christianity needs to constantly um, question mm. and and. and Perhaps there are certain modes of thinking within that that, that need to be embraced as well. Hmm. Do you see, as, as China becomes more confident on the world stage in a variety of different arenas, do you see that, that lending more impetus to Chinese theologians doing more, not completely independent, but um, more Chinese contextual theology in their own right? Yes, uh, I, th- I think that's definitely a, a trend um, in which many uh, Chinese Christians are mm. trying to articulate their own theologies. And mm. um, I mean, obviously, you know, you, you, you cannot do mm. away with Christianity's past, mm. Christianity's hi- history. And, you know, y- y- you need to think about mm. the Calvins, the, the Kuypers, the Augustans, mm. and, and so forth. Um, but there are. Uh, both explicit and implicit uh, uh, reflections of theology that are happening uh, today mm. in China. And how have you seen Eastern Orthodoxy engaging with questions around Chinese contextual theology? Yeah, Eastern Orthodoxy, I think, mm. is, um, uh, is a valuable uh, resource in, in terms of um, the ideas that it has uh, to present. Uh, in particular, many of um, the Chinese Christians uh, today um, mm-hmm. are very much shaped by a Western or, or Protestant Catholic um, type of a theological background. Mm-hmm. Um, Eastern Orthodoxy, of course, uh, coming from the Eastern um, or, or mm-hmm. Greek branch of the Christianity, mm-hmm. um, has preserved certain things that, that go back you know, to the early patristics um, mm-hmm. in which the Western church has tended to move away from. And so I think Eastern Orthodox theology, together with, with mm. Western theology, particularly ideas like theosis or mm. um, deification um, and, 
questions of, uh, of, of the relationship between humanity and, and, and divinity. These are ideas which um, can have a place in, in the Chinese context as well. And in, in some ways actually are reflected within aspects of Chinese Christianity today. Mm -hmm. That some parts of Chinese Christianity have, uh, so, some aspects of Chinese Christian theology mm -hmm have uh, uh, theologies in which speak about uh, humanity's union with God. And that is not coming from the Western missionaries that they heard, it, heard the gospel from. Uh, and it's not coming from Eastern Orthodoxy because Eastern Orthodoxy was not uh, brought in, was not a missioning force in China. So where does this come from? And I, I personally believe that, that some of this actually comes from the Chinese traditional uh, ideas that there is um, within Chinese uh, traditional um, philosophies and, and religions, there's this idea in which humanity can be united with heaven, uh, a mm -hmm. type of uh, deity, if you will. Um, and that sensibility of, of a union with heaven becomes translated into a unity with God within mm -hmm. Christianity. And there's this uh, this this sense of this unity which um, is articulated most clearly, I think, within the Eastern Orthodox tradition. So Eastern Orthodox theology, mm. as well as the Protestant and Catholic theologies brought together in the Chinese context, I think are, are useful in, in engaging with um, the situation mm. today in China. Um, this. Um, with this plethora of, of ideologies that are intersecting in this one place um, that helps to clarify or helps to bring a different face of Christianity mm. into China. Mm, that's very interesting. I was talking to a friend uh, who had lunch with Mother Teresa and he was a young man and he said to Mother Teresa, I'm trying to discern what God's will is for my life. Can you help me? And she said to him, you need to stop thinking like a Westerner. Um, you don't discern God's will. You are God's will or unite with God's will. And it made me wonder about the difference between Eastern and Western thought in terms of union with God, embodiment of God's will and so on. Do you see some of those ideas reflected here in, in Eastern Orthodoxy and in Chinese thought? Yes, I, I think that's definitely um, a sense that is within both Eastern Orthodoxy and the Chinese uh, Christianity. Mm -hmm. There's many within uh, Chinese Christianity that, um, despite the growth in Calvinism, there's been many within mm -hmm. Chinese Christianity that have had theologies that are very much against um, a, um, a very deterministic uh, tendency mm -hmm. uh, that we see in Calvinism. Um, and are more drawn to a synergistic relationship between God and humanity in which um, we are working as co-workers uh, alongside of, of God. And this is, this is an idea that, that I think is, is very much captured within um, Chinese uh, historical uh, traditions, um, and religious and philosophical traditions, but also within Eastern Orthodoxy and Chinese Christianity today. What excites you the most uh, as you look at what's happening in the church in China today? Well, there's a lot of things that excite well, me about that. You can give us a list if you want. <laughs> um, probably the thing that's exciting me the most about uh, Christianity in China today is the, the changes that it's having on society, and the, the growth and articulation of an indigenous Christianity, mm -hmm. one that can, can very much be appreciated as being Chinese, and one that um, is able to have a very strong voice within China um, to the fear of the government in, in many senses, uh, but also um, that as China is becoming a very strong force globally, economically, and uh, in, in, in different uh, uh, intellectually and so forth, um, it is also a growing force in terms of the Christian growth as well. And I think that's exciting, and that, that brings um, 
it brings a lot of challenges to the global church, um, but it also brings a lot of uh, beauty um, that that I think uh, um, well the global church can grow from. What concerns you the most about the church in China today? What concerns me the most about the church in China today is the challenges that are offered from the more global world um, as well as uh, from the, the, the Chinese society. Um, what I mean by that is uh, oftentimes Christianity um, in China wants to be just Western. Um, many Chinese want to just be Western. Um, and in the, the, the path of following that, oftentimes take up the worst of what is Western, if, mm. if you will. Yeah. Um, and not really reflecting and thinking deeply about what it really needs. And likewise, within China, um, there's been many um, uh, new... Uh, growth of uh, persecution within the church in China in the last few years. Um, there's uh, what, what we call uh, the, the Jerusalem of China, Wenzhou, which um, uh, has the most Christians of any one part of, of China today. Uh, in the last uh, two years have had a lot of persecution. The government has been taking off crosses from hundreds of churches. Um, and this is forcing the, those churches to rethink, well, what is it that we stand for? What is the gospel? Um, is it building these magnificent churches with the, the mm. steeples and the crosses? Or is there something much deeper, much, mm. um, much more um, within our community and our people that we need to think mm. about? And so for, for Chinese Christianity, like any other Christianity, the, 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 the biggest challenge is perhaps uh, the challenge of uh, arrogance, in a sense. Mm. Um, that, well, we just got this, and we know it all, and we've, mm. we've achieved it all. But it's much more than that. Mm. The gospel is much more than that. Mm. What do you think is most misunderstood about Chinese Christianity? The thing that's most misunderstood about Chinese Christianity is it cannot be understood. <laughs> China is a very, very vast country. Yeah. And there are many, many different uh, expressions of Christianity throughout. Mm. Um, and oftentimes people say, well, you know, uh, the church in China, well, it's all, it's all Pentecostal. No, it's not. You know, or uh, there's, a, there's a three self church that's sold itself to the state, and there's mm. house churches, and that's where the true Christians are. Maybe, maybe not. There's, it, it's a lot more mm. complicated than that. Mm. And I think um, the more and more I study and, and, and travel to and, and speak to people in, in China, uh, the more and more I realize I don't know as much as I thought. Hmm. Um, what do you think are some of the things that the Chinese church, and you've just told us it's a very complex <laughs> tapestry, but what do you think are some of the things that the Chinese church can teach Western Christianity today? I think the Chinese church can... Um, on the one hand, teach uh, Western churches how to pray. Um, oftentimes, uh, when I hear about um, how Western churches pray for the churches in China, it's often a question of, well, we, we need to pray for, uh, against the persecutions. Um, but for many uh, in China, the persecutions is where the gospel has grown through. Um, and it's more than just the persecutions is more mm. about how they follow God, that they, they, the, the need to follow God and to, mm. to run after Him rather than um, to run away from the persecution. Um, another thing that uh, I think the, the Chinese church has to offer to the West is um, a different appreciation of, um, uh, of culture. Um, of the cultural background of China. Um, religiously, uh, philosophically, is very much intertwined with everyday mm. life. From, you know, what do you eat at the dinner table 
is very religiously, philosophically intertwined, um, to how do you treat your mother and your father um, mm. is very much part of the life of um, uh, an average Chinese. And that gets embedded into the Chinese mm. Christianity, um, in which for Westerners, I think, um, Westerners also need to learn how embedded um, Western traditional thoughts are, um, how embedded uh, 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 pagan holidays like Christmas and Easter mm. are, and, and how embedded um, is enlightenment thought into our individualistic uh, tendencies and, and what, what have you, um, that there is a, a need for a deep reflection uh, about who we are and um, what uh, our Christianity is. Mm. Is there anything else that you want to say to us today? I think um, probably the, the one thing I, I, I want to say is uh, learn more about the church. Uh, learn more about the church globally. Learn more about the church uh, that you are part of. Um, mm -hmm. And learn more about uh, who you are um, and where you come from. Uh, because for, for a person like myself, uh, I, I was born in the U.S. to, to Chinese ethnic background. Uh, I've lived in uh, quite a number of countries in North America, Europe, and in uh, China. And everywhere I go, I find I am a foreigner in these lands. Mm. Um, but it is when I recognize that I'm a foreigner in these lands that I realize that I need to know who I am and where mm. I come from and where my background is and how that influences and shapes both good and bad, hmm. the Christianity that I know. I've noticed when I've been talking to often North Americans, on one hand, a concern for the persecuted church in China, or their idea of the persecuted church, uh, not necessarily an understanding of the complex tapestry we're talking about, but an idea of a persecuted church on the one hand. But on the other hand, a, a fear or suspicion or you, you add some other words there about China itself and about Chinese people, mm. about Chinese immigration. So it feels to me that in the West, including amongst Christians, there's a, a there's multiple feelings or going on. Mm. So what's your sense about how Western Christians can become better engaged with China, better informed? about Chinese culture and Chinese people, you know, more sympathetic to, to Chinese who are coming into the West, you know, the sorts of issues that I'm, I'm dealing with here? Yeah, um, th that's a very complex issue. Um, and I think uh, having myself lived in North America for uh, many years and then uh, living in the UK and, and as well as in China, um, I've seen different faces of this um, uh, this this fear or this uh, mm. uncertainty about yeah. um, uh, China or Chinese uh, people or Chinese uh, um, what have you, um, and I think the simple answer the simple answer is get to know some, and mm. and uh, um, there's probably some of those fears that are valid, um, but there's probably a lot of those fears that aren't or. Mm. Um, really need a, a, a shift in thinking. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a, a, a real quick story. Um, you know, I, I've traveled uh, prior to, to living in, in, in China. I've, I've, I've traveled there many times for research trips and, and what have you. And you know, one, one of the things that always gets me about China is, is when you have to cross a street. You know, with the cars, you know, you, you, you basically have to close your eyes and walk or you never get to the other side. Um, and when I was living in China, uh, before I came here, um, I, I had that idea in my head that, you know, you just cannot, uh, cross the street and, and, you know, how do people drive in here until I realized that there weren't that many car accidents, that very few Chinese would actually run into each other 
-hmm. Yeah, they're going into the opposite lane of traffic and uh, holding their hand on the horn and waving their hand at mm -hmm. the next driver and what have you, but there's very few accidents. And I realize there's a logic there that is very illogical in my mind, but there is a logic there that is very different. And it wasn't until I really lived there with mm -hmm. the people and really experienced uh, the driving day in and day out that I realized that it's not as illogical as I thought. It may be illogical mm. if you bring a whole bunch of those drivers and brought them to LA or mm. you know San Francisco or uh, you know Sydney, Australia mm. or wherever, um, and there's a clash of logics. Mm. Um, but over time, there's a negotiation that happens, and you learn from one another. Mm. And I think that's that's a great analogy for. Mm. Um, uh, West, the Western Church, um, to think about China and Chinese Christianity, mm -hmm. that uh, oftentimes we think we, we know what it is that's there. Um, it's a lot more complicated than we, we realize, and it requires a paradigm shift to really mm -hmm. understand what's there. Um, but when we do, then we realize that we need to really negotiate and, mm -hmm. and, and have a sort of symbiotic relationship with uh, these different ways of thinking and these different ways of mm. living. How does Chinese language shape the Chinese imagination or shape Chinese theology? I think Chinese language affects, or Chinese language or any language mm. affects so much in theology, much more than we, we, mm. we've, uh, uh, we've really engage mm. with um, in, in scholarship or what have you. Uh, to take a simple example, um, mm. you know, you, you, you cannot address somebody as your brother without speaking about whether they're older or younger than you. Mm. And so if you think about in the Gospels, when Peter and Andrew are introduced, which one's mm. older? Or perhaps a better one is Mary and Martha. When, they, when one serves Jesus and the other is, uh, is sitting at his feet, which one's older? It has very profound implications mm. to how to interpret that passage. Mm. Um, and therefore, uh, the language, how the Chinese language communicates relationships influences how the church relationships mm. exist. Um, and that there's embedded in the language is a sense of order and hierarchy that gets imported into the sense of a church. Um, that's just a very simple example, but, but language really um, has these different nuances that um, really shape um, the way that Christians think about themselves and think about God. Um, I think it was... Uh, uh, Lama Sana, uh, that you know, mm. he he makes the uh, the big argument that you know Christianity has always been one that's been translated from you know Jesus speaking to his disciples in Aramaic, mm. written mm. in the Gospels in Greek, translated into Latin, and then this uh, <laughs> this awful language called English, and you know um, you know it's always one of translation, yeah. and it's not that. Uh, there, there's often this emphasis on ethereal intent, right? On, on trying mm. to understand what the original uh, author meant. Um, so ask God, um, because only He knows, I suppose. Uh, and uh, but, but through the layers of translation, um, culture and um, uh, and society and peoples. Um, experiences uh, really shape a very different understanding of, of who God is um, in very subtle but um, important ways. Mm. It's, it's sometimes been said that other Asian societies like Korean society has become more Confucian than China itself. Is China as hierarchical as it once was or has it become flatter in the life of the church, for instance? That's a, that's a great question. Um, 
about uh, two years ago, there was a, a, an event that happened that I, really caught me off guard uh, in which uh, the Chinese government passed a new law that required uh, adult children to visit their parents or suffer fines and possible mm. uh, prison time. Mm. And this was remarkable in the historic home of Confucius, right, in which the communist government must mandate adult children to visit and care for their parents, mm. no matter how far they live from them. And that really highlights how with the, the move of the market society, the move of urbanization, um, how many people migrate around China to get a better job and better education, that this has, and, and also the, the one child policy, that all these things together have really pushed down upon this hierarchical society that was taught from a very long time, for a very long time. Um, what we have, though, I believe, is not a ridding of all this, but a reshaping of it. That the hierarchy is no longer within the family, but is in, um, is in the office place, is in the church, um, is within the, the government, in which you have um, uh, these different um, replacement communities for the family. And that the hierarchy is still very prevalent mm -hmm. there. And there is a very, so within the church, there's a very high respect for the pastor and the pastor's wife, who has a, a special mm -hmm. title by, by herself. Um, there's no title for a pastor's mm -hmm. husband, oddly enough. <laughs> um, but there's a, you know, there's a special titles for the pastor mm -hmm. and the pastor's wife. And there's, there's terms that we use for Christians that are brothers and sisters in the church. And there's is, is very familial mm -hmm. language um, and very much a, a, a strong community that is reinforced within the midst of this hierarchy as well. And so... I think the church in China is one of the places in which you have a new family, a surrogate family coming about, in which the hierarchies are remapped within the church. Of course, there's forces that are pushing against that, but I, I think that that way of thinking is still very much embedded within society. Now, now China also is a society that values education and yes. knowledge. How does the value for not only for family, but for education and knowledge, affect the way that churches see themselves, see how they relate to scripture. What does that do for the imagination of the Christian congregation? Yeah, that's uh, the, the importance of education um, and the importance of, of studying does um, enforce a, a more it pushes towards a more intellectualized Christianity um, in which uh, for, for many people um, you know, to study the Bible and to memorize scripture but also to study uh, theology and there's lots of theology being translated uh, from, from Western contexts being translated into Chinese and you know, uh, for, for theology to be read and, and to know um, Christian theology well um, is, is a very strong uh, and, and good influence on the growth of the church. But it also causes problems. It causes um, a very strong sense of, well, I'm right because I know all this. Um, mm. And so there's a risk that comes with that. Um, but that, that's also something that is perhaps not a universal thing. Um, that there are different sectors of society which um, are not able to access the theology and access the mm. ideas the same way. Mm. Um, but scripture, the Bible, is still a very um, high priority mm. within um, many Chinese churches today. Mm. Alex Chow, thank you for joining us at the Global Church Project. Thank you very much.
The Global Church Project is located at www.theglobalchurchproject.com. On our website, you'll find a wide range of interviews and resources for colleges, universities, and churches. I look forward to your company next time. From me, goodbye.